Welcome everyone. I am here with Maureen. For those of you who know, this is former podcast co-host Maureen. We were together for quite a long time uh, podcasting and she is the founder of Rethinking Normal, which is a platform that helps educators uh, with facilitation for anti-oppressive uh, learning. Yeah, <laughs> you're doing great. Sorry, I'm like, what? What's the tagline? No, I'm actually um, very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. So we're going to do something a bit different today. Maureen's going to be interviewing me a little bit um, about my uh, education journey, I suppose, what I hope to teach in my classes and uh, yeah, how I do it or how I try to do it. Um, and then because Maureen is uh, the creator of a number of facilitation activities that I have started to dabble with and use in my teaching, uh, we're going to talk about a few of those activities and how I've used them. Um, and yeah, how they were received and, and all of that. So we're going to do part one of this conversation on this channel. And part two is going to be on Maureen's new channel, which is Rethinking Normal. So Maureen, do you new want to, <laughs> yeah, new baby channel. Do yeah. you want to talk a bit about Rethinking Normal since I feel like I didn't quite pitch it as well as I You're not doing yourself <laughs> justice. I think you did great. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I started facilitating about 10 years ago and even when we were doing the podcast together and when I formally had a YouTube channel educating about a bunch of other things, um, I still really wanted that connection with groups in person mm -hmm. um, and through facilitated dialogue activities. So I stopped any online creation for a while and I've been mostly facilitating in person. I work with young people um, and also with teachers in schools. Um, I spent the last year working in corporate settings, uh, designing and delivering anti-oppression learning programs. And I also have a huge interest in documenting the activities that I create. Um, and so I've documented a host of activities on my website, rethinkingnormal.org. And I've very recently created a YouTube channel where um, I'm talking to people about how I run them. And I also want to create videos on, um, just facilitation strategies and interviewing other educators like yourself, um, who educate about radical topics. Absolutely. And I would definitely recommend your channel. I've already learned a lot about just strategies for asking effective questions, honestly. Um, because yeah, I kind of fall into the lecturer category where I'm trying to move away from just strictly lecturing at people and incorporate more facilitation activities and things that are really going to get people to have those light bulb moments, but do it themselves as opposed to me just telling them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, very much recommend the channel. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. So again, this is part one and part two will be on Rethinking Normal. Cool. All right. So I'll start. <laughs> uh, I would love to ask you about what it is that you teach. I know in the big picture what it is that you teach, but I always love to hear you speak more about it. And I'm sure your viewers would enjoy that as well. And I'm really interested in the paradigm shifts that you hope your course will have in the minds of your students? First of all, I kind of love being interviewed on my own channel. This is kind of cool. I so know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I teach, so I teach environmental studies and geography. And for anyone who knows those fields, I teach spe specifically political ecology, which is basically looking at how um, environmental issues are not just biophysical, they're always inescapably political. It's basically taking a political economy lens to look at the environment. But it's also more than that, because we also look at discourses and, and whatnot. Um, and so I guess the paradigm shifts I'm trying to uh, give to students are ones that I had <laughs> when I was going through school. Um, and basically, a lot of it does have to do around political economy and also dominant narratives. Um, so we look at how uh, discourses and dominant narratives circulate and how they gain power, like who has who has the power to speak truth about nature or about the economy or, or anything else, um, and then how those dominant narratives get internalized by us and influence our our thoughts and behaviors towards the environment. And then that is obviously like we have the discursive realm, right? And then we also have the material realm, so the political mm -hmm. economy. And both of those things are linked dialectically, <laughs> as we know. Um, so they both influence each other. Um, mm -hmm. So the other realm is, is political economy. So yeah, how does 
how do politics, how do, does economics um, influence our decisions and our choices around the environment or, you know, what are, I guess, the environmental externalities of the political economic system that we are operating? Um, and then how does that feed into dominant narratives and, and further influence people's behaviors? So it's really kind of unraveling, like creating a holistic sense of um, why different environmental phenomena happen. Um, and then what the implications are for justice and for well-being and for ecological health and long-term sustainability, all of that. One example that I could draw on is the idea of wilderness. And I talked about this in a video, I mean, several videos, but the video called... Um, Half Earth. <laughs> what is the title of my own video? I can't remember. Neoliberal Nature and the Half Earth Movement or something. I'll link it below. Um, anyway, but uh, so our, our idea of wilderness has been shaped for a long time in specifically North America um, through our experiences with colonialism and whatnot. But uh, we have this idea of wilderness as this people free, pristine landscape. Um, and that has evolved over time. And uh, so basically the implications of that are that when we think about conservation, we've created these conservation spaces that are bounded in space. They're kind of far away from cities and suburbs, far away from where people live. Um, and we've enforced really strict rules about what can happen within or outside of those boundaries. And uh, so that has legitimated the expulsion of indigenous people from these spaces even though um, the wilderness as we know it was produced by people living in those spaces and um, you know practicing their livelihoods in, in a particular way. That's one aspect of it. But of course, the discursive realm is also very linked to the political economic realm, right? And so um, another reason that we've created conservation spaces in those ways uh, is because A, you know, it was a way for uh, colonists to come over and grab a lot of land. Um, and it was also a way to delineate uh, a different kind of political economy within those spaces. So most of them, the original national parks were created to be uh, destinations for commercial tourism. And in Canada, it was around the Canadian Pacific Railway where they wanted to have destinations to bring their, their wealthy white settler uh, travelers. Um, and so they were in these spaces that were, you know, just really awe inspiring beauty and whatnot. But basically, they would kick out Indigenous people who were producing the, those spaces themselves um, and then decide that, OK, traditional livelihoods are not allowed in this boundary. But, you know, what is allowed, um, you know, luxury hotels. And, mm -hmm. you know, now there's uh, entire town sites in there that, that have like Lululemon and stuff. Right. Um, in some of them, a lot of them don't allow that. But. Uh, they do still allow, uh, you know, commercial tourism for the most part. Um, so it's just delineating a new political economy within that space. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's kind of like the discursive is connected to the material. Um, and the result is um, us relating to the environment through a capitalist lens, um, and also not that great results in terms of conservation. So a lot mm -hmm. of our spaces, um, and this has to do with climate change too, but a lot of them, you know, ecological integrity has been declining over time. So that's just one example of kind of connecting those two things. Um, another one is lawns, the moral economy and the political e economy of lawns, which I also have a video about, which I will mm -hmm. link below. So shameless plug, but, but yeah, those are kind of the ideas that I try to, to get at. Mm -hmm. Yeah even just the paradigm of like our idea about nature as this like people free land that is separate from us then mm -hmm. allows us to yes. commodify nature. Absolutely. Understanding nature as outside of us and external to us is what allows for its commodification. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in, in a lot of the societies that were, uh, capitalist early on, uh, and then became the colonizers of the world, um, they very much held that idea of like nature being separate, nature being out there. That is also very linked to their particular political economy because under their political economy, like nature was out there, right? Like nature was resource. And so mm -hmm. that it, they kind of both feed off of each other. But mm -hmm. yeah, that is, that is the main idea, I guess I'm trying to dismantle. Mm -hmm. And then also to get people to think about like how, like how is that then, how are we then, operating in a way that is detrimental to both the environment and us um, mm -hmm. based on these ideas and these systems that we build around these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you lead your students to that realization? I'm interested in this because I'm seeing actually with you 
describing like what your course is on, like the differences in the approach of lecturing and facilitating um, in a really interesting way. And I think both of those modes of teaching are super important and they both need to happen, right? But I think I would start at a very personal level of like, when you think of nature, or when I tell you the word nature, like what comes up? What image does that conjure for you? What has your relationship been to nature when you were a kid versus when you've been an adult? And then like just really getting into what does that, what could that maybe tell us? I think we're both really interested in like how the stories that we're told influence the material results of, mm -hmm. of what we see out in the world. And I think both approaches, like maybe you start more with the the results, mm -hmm. what has happened and what systems maintain it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe backtracking to the ideology. I see, I actually like, I, I found that very validating because I actually do start my course with those kind of questions. Cause I start with the social construction of nature to get people to mm. under, understand, like, how do you understand nature? And like, what, when you think of something that's natural or unnatural, like, what do you think of? We read Cronin, uh, The Trouble with Wilderness, and just really kind of dig into those ideas. Um, mm. But yeah, so the way that I teach it, the first semester is basically looking at a bunch of different um, theoretical frameworks that we can use to analyze the environment. Um, and so that would be like the social construction of nature. We look at, you know, population, property, political economy, market-based environmentalism, geoengineering and um, ecological modernization, environmental justice, ethics, and indigenous perspectives and different worldviews. Um, and then the second semester, we look at case studies where we can apply some of those theoretical frameworks. Um, mm. usually, usually several of them will apply to a particular topic. And so one of them would be, you know, national parks, uh, like conservation. We do one on agriculture. We do one on lawns. We do one on natural disasters. We do one on celebrity conservation and philanthropy. Um, yeah. So basically it's taking what the, the frameworks and then applying them to understand different phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and I try to build the course out so that learning is iterative so that earlier frameworks lead up to later ones in, in the sense that, you know, readings that we do later on will reference, um, the readings that we did earlier on so that people mm -hmm. can see the progression of ideas or see how certain people have, uh, disagreed with earlier, uh, theories or whatnot. But like I said, I do, <laughs> I am mostly lecturing, but I am, I feel like this past year has gone pretty well in terms of me. I like I always ask questions and, and stimulate a lot of dialogue. Um, and we do questions on the readings and stuff and talk mm -hmm. about those. Um, but I feel like this year I'm, I'm really starting to, I mean, thanks to you think about different ways of asking questions and, and, and bringing in more of that facilitation. Um, but yeah, that's basically kind of how I laid that laid it out. How are your students responding to it? You think well, <laughs> really well, for the most part. Well, um, I mean, I get like, you know, a range of different students. Um, but for the most part, I I am seeing these paradigm shifts happen by the end of the course, you know, like a mm. lot of people are like, wow, um, they really understand political economy, they really understand the way that these systems work and why they work and um, have really deconstructed a lot of their own, you know, preconceived notions and uh, their thoughts about dominant narratives. Um, of course, I mean, there's a, a range of people, right? Because people are taking my course. Not all of them are really interested in the topic. They're just taking it because they need <laughs> credit. And so yeah. a lot of them are like business students. Some of them will, you know, either not Not care. be business students by the <laughs> end. <laughs> some of them will not be business students by the end, but some of them, a few of them will. And I'm just like, uh, you know, like what's happening. But yeah, for the, for the most part, I would say the vast majority are, are having the kind of shifts that I want them to have. And I think that the hard work of being a teacher sometimes is like, you're that initial seed planter and mm -hmm. you're not going to see what it grows into mm -hmm. later down the line. And that's, that's sort of what keeps me going because even students that are more resistant or that are experiencing a ton of cognitive dissonance in the class and that just have an emotional reaction that's quite negative. Yes. I'm like, I feel like a lot of my early learning experiences were that for me, learning about other experiences, learning about other worldviews, and it really just being upsetting on a really visceral level. And as you said, like it's, it, 
it is, I think new learnings and paradigm shifts a lot of times lead to these identity crises, right? And, and sometimes you're like, oh, wait, what I felt when I was young, when I was really young and I was just thinking to myself, like, why are we doing this? Or right. saying to my family or whatever, like, oh, I was onto something. There. Right. And then that yeah. leads to a whole bunch of anger. So yeah. yeah, I think there's so much, I think that's why thinking about early experiences and and like trying to visualize that invisible socialization that we all had as kids can be such a powerful way to lead to those paradigm shifts. Yeah, no, that's such a good point because sometimes I do feel like when you're in the classroom and you're in the situation of having people resist and just saying things that are just like so out there, you know, um, it feels really bad and it feels really um, like there, it's hard not to feel like, oh my God, I'm failing and just kind mm -hmm. of lose, just like a really heavy feeling. And, and, but I think that's true just in terms of like thinking about the planting of the seeds. Cause I remember in one class that I had in university, it was an anthropology course and we were learning about, nationalism and the idea of imagined communities and the <laughs> ta came in and was just telling us like what if i told you that canada doesn't exist and we were all just like that's ridiculous <laughs> like oh come on you know um and i remember being so mad and just being like what is this like who is this person you know um but then by the end of it i was like oh yeah like borders oh, yeah it literally like, doesn't like it literally is just like, yeah exactly so um yeah, that's true. You know, um, yeah, so it's a, a good thing to kind of hold on to if you're in those moments, I think. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I like to do with students is just like really visibilizing the dominant narratives early on and just acknowledging that that is the reference point that all of us are working from. Mm -hmm. And to just try and be patient, be like, well, I'm not saying all of these are wrong. I'm not saying yeah. all these are bad. Right. They're, they're here, you know, they're not going to yeah. go away. <laughs> like, right, right, right. But we're going to explore some other ways of like understanding and seeing things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And understand like why it's here and mm -hmm. what purpose it serves and what the implications are. Right. Yeah. So, and to think about like, do we want to keep thinking this way um, yeah. and then behaving this way, you know? So, yeah. Well, I, as you've mentioned throughout the video, you've tried some more facilitated activities and I would love to hear about those, like how you are using the activities that I've designed to perhaps like start conversations or start your lecture on these larger topics. So, sure. so everyone, let's head over to my channel. <laughs> yeah, Do we say that? Us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> join us on the other <laughs> channel. Join us on the other channel. For part two. Exactly. Okay. See you there. Yeah, cool. Bye everyone.